so what did we do last time? Um, so we uh, we talked a bit about friction, right? Uh, and then we got into iterative learning control and um, or ILCs. And uh, kind of ran out of time last time for uh, the last couple little nuggets on that stuff that I wanted to do. So we'll do that real quick today uh, to finish up. I think that's a really cool algorithm that um, people did some really awesome stuff with it about 10 years ago. And then it's one of the, like many other topics in this field, like basically fell out of fashion as soon as people got into deep RL and forgot about the rest of control theory. Uh, but it's, I think it's cool. I think there's still some interesting things to do with that. Um, so what else? Okay, so today we'll, we'll finish up ILC. Um, and then uh, we're going to talk a bit about uh, stochastic optimal control. So last time, you know, we kind of talked about what if you have model errors. Today, we're going to talk about like stochastic systems, noise, how to deal with that at a high level, uh, like a little bit of the theory. And then we're going to get specifically into um, the, the famous LQG problem. So this is basically the LQR, the stochastic version of LQR that we've talked a bunch about. Uh, and it's at the end of this, the answer is LQR plus a Kalman filter, which many of you might know, but there's some really cool little theoretical nuggets in there. Um, namely, the certainty equivalence principle and the separation principle. Has anyone heard of this stuff before? So this is kind of fun. Um, these are like really interesting results in the linear quadratic case that um, hold, that basically say you can write down a state estimator separately from your controller and that that's still optimal. Uh, but that result is not true in the more general nonlinear setting, but we still do it all the time. So it's like a kind of interesting thing. So we're going to do that today, hopefully, uh, as long as we have time. These are like super classic results that are, I don't know, the bread and butter of, of control theory. So this stuff and then LQG problem. Okay, cool. Any questions about any of that? All right, let's do it. So. Um, just to kind of finish off from last time, um, I'm going to go ahead and like summarize what we did uh, on the ILC stuff. We'll write down the ILC algorithm kind of at a pseudocode level and then talk about a little bit about why this should work. Um, so to summarize last time, and I'm not going to write out all the details. Um, they're in the notes from last time, right? But uh, essentially what, what you want to do here is... Um, so given a nominal trajectory, X bar, U bar, we have some X bar, U bar uh, computed with a a nominal model. Um, what we want to do is use rollouts on the real system to compute an update to the U's, so like a, a delta U, such that the true system achieves the X bar trajectory, attracts the X bar trajectory. Okay, that's what we're trying to do. And sort of at a high level, the algorithm looks like the following thing. So we're going to first do a rollout. So we'll say like XK, UK uh, at a given iteration is coming from a rollout on the real system of the uh, like sort of X bar, U bar stuff. Basically, we're going to roll out from X naught bar using the open loop controls U bar, right? And this is on the real system. And 
Then we're going to um, solve the following optimization problem. We're going to compute a delta x delta u based on um, solving the following sort of local optimal control problem. And there's lots of flavors of this as we kind of talked about. This is the one we did where we got this thing to look like a QP. So we wrote down like this cost function that was quadratic in the update in the delta x delta u. And you get that by basically Taylor. Roughly what you're doing here is Taylor expanding this thing about the reference and plugging in the errors from the actual rollout. So we have this subject to uh, the dynamics, uh, the linearized dynamics computed using the nominal model. And then also, you know, possibly subject to other constraints, right? So you can put torque limits on this in particular, or really kind of any other constraints you might, you might care about. You can enforce constraints in here. This is why you want to do it as a QP and not that sort of straight up Newton update that we talked about at first. Um, okay, so this thing. This is a QP if you basically you know, expand J to second order and delta X, delta U, and then you have the linear dynamics, right? And then once we've solved that problem for delta X, delta U, we're gonna just update U bar. And we're gonna do this whole loop uh, while we have some error you know, that, that's bigger than we want. So while this sort of XK minus X bar K kind of thing is greater than some tolerance. So this really looks exactly like SQP as I've written it down here. The only difference is the rollout step is the real stuff on a real hardware system as opposed to in simulation using some dynamics model, right? Um, and not, in fact, you can solve this with SQP. You can also solve this with DDP, right? You can solve this using any of the trajectory optimization methods we've talked about. The key difference is you're replacing the dynamics model with the real hardware rollout. And then you're solving the Newton thing or the backward Riccati thing using the, the sort of mathematical model that you have, the nominal model. Okay, yeah. So does the reference make it look feasible? So it's, um, it is, so, so the rollout's obviously feasible. The original reference trajectory, the X bar, probably isn't feasible on the real system, right? Because it's coming from that nominal model. So if that model has a bunch of error in it, the X bar is not really going to be feasible, right? So ultimately, you're not going to be able to get that, that tracking cost to be exactly zero, but you can weight it however you want, right? So in the swing up task, for example, we can put a huge penalty weight on the terminal state to achieve the swing up and say, we don't really care about what happens so much along the trajectory. We just care about getting up to the top. So we're willing to tolerate some error, right? And you can kind of you can weight that thing at the bottom if you want to differently, right? To, to say what you care about. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, is that, so do you have to use a like, reference trajectory that's feasible with respect to the nominal model, or could you do the cartoony thing? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so in theory, you could do the cartoony thing here. Um, I mean, in general, you could just straight up do this from scratch instead of SQP, right? You could start from nothing, like no nominal trajectory and just do SQP with this in the loop in theory, right? And like, that would be kind of the same thing or, or imagine DDP where the rollouts are on the real hardware instead of on the SIM. Um, you, so you could totally do it from scratch. It's just that, you know, you're now talking about doing maybe dozens or even hundreds of trials instead of a couple, right? So you that this is basically like a recipe for doing SIM to real transfer when you're, you know, SIM model is bad. So you do the initial traj opt using the nominal model all in SIM. So you can do that in seconds, right? And then I can take that and transfer it to the hardware in like five, six trials instead of, if I had to do the whole thing on the hardware, it might take hours, right? That makes sense. All of this is way more efficient than doing like black box RL. It's kind of the, the other point to make here. Um, so like, all right, so any other questions about this? Everybody good? Okay. so. Um, I'm going to go, we'll go do this in a sec. I just wanted to sort of like a little kind of aside on like why this should converge and why this is like maybe a reasonable thing to do in general that may be interesting to people. 
Um, so in particular, right, we're using this nominal model that we know is wrong to compute all the Jacobians and stuff, right? So why should that still work? And the answer is basically that um, Newton's method still works in general, even if the stuff in the KKT matrix is off by quite a bit, actually. And this is kind of the theory behind, if anyone's heard of quasi-Newton methods or like BFGS, LBFGS, these kind of things, that's kind of, it's the same idea. Like those things are all approximating the Hessian in various ways. They don't get the same uh, convergence rate as, as full Newton with exact derivatives, but they can still achieve pretty fast, in fact, super linear convergence, right? They're still better than gradient descent. They still do quite well, even if there's quite large errors in the Jacobians. So that's kind of what's going on here. Um, so to sort of formalize this, um, we've already seen, you know, various approximations to Newton. Um, in particular, we've done Gauss-Newton, right? Which is a, already an approximation to the Hessian. Uh, and there's lots more things like that. So Gauss-Newton. And the other thing we did right at the very beginning, we did this regularization stuff where we were messing with the Hessian. So obviously there, the Hessian's not exact either. So, you know, based on that experience, obviously Newton can still work with like inexact stuff. Um, so in general, there's a whole family of methods you can do. Um, there's, um, so-called inexact Newton methods. And there's uh, also so-called quasi-Newton methods. These aren't exactly the same thing. So does anyone know what these are? Do you know what the difference here is? Has anyone done this stuff before? Yeah. Uh, I actually, I think lazy Newton would probably, I never heard of that term, but I'm it's yeah. like, you only do the, you only do your equivalent once and then you just use ah, the okay. over and over again. No, that's a different thing. So yeah, that is a common thing that usually you do at the end of the solve. And usually we call that like polishing or something. So no, these are different things. So, um, quasi Newton methods are things like BFGS where you do that, but then you do rank one updates on the matrix as you go. Basically you do like finite difference updates based on your history of gradients. You can update the, the matrix. Um, and then inexact Newton methods are where you have a giant matrix that you don't actually want to factorize and form in memory. So what you do instead in the, in, to solve that linear system, you, you use matrix free methods or um, iterative linear algebra methods like CG, this kind of thing to solve the linear system without ever explicitly forming the KKT matrix. So those are both these methods. They both like kind of approximate the Newton step in various ways. And the reasons for these things is so you can solve really huge problems without like, uh, so you can scale it and not have to solve that linear system, which can be quite expensive. Um, there's lots of versions of this. The most common ones, as I just kind of said, would be BFGS, uh, Broyden, if anyone's heard of Broyden. Uh, Anderson acceleration is another version of this that maybe is popular now. Um, and then also Newton CG is another one. So use conjugate gradient to solve the KKT system. Um, and these things have a well-developed theory. There's like, you can prove convergence of these things and all kinds of good stuff. So approximating that thing is fine. And that's exactly what we're doing. And we're kind of doing the lazy Newton thing here, right? More or less. Okay, so for a generic root finding problem, so the stuff we've talked about a bunch, right? Where we kind of Taylor expand this thing to first order. set this Taylor expansion to zero and solve, right? This is the exact Newton step. We solve this thing.
And there's uh, a kind of trivial inequality that you can write down. So as long as the delta x you get from whatever you're doing, whatever quasi-Newton approximate thing you're doing, satisfies um, the following thing. Should write this down on the other line. So as long as it satisfies this, this thing, it's basically the delta x step satisfies the inequality that it's, that thing's less than uh, some eta times the original value. For some eta less than one, uh, and an exact Newton method will converge. It's basically saying as long as you can get a, a descent step that's like got this sort of geometric factor eta out front, which is basically a convergence rate, this will work. And in general, this is slower than real full up Newton. But it's still in general pretty good. And this means we can uh, use some like J that approximates the real Jacobian in here to compute the delta x, right? And you can imagine, right, if you have, if you know a lot about the problem, you can kind of like say this in your approximation, you can bound everything and actually compute the eta for simple problems and, and have like pretty sharp theoretical results that this should work. Okay, so that was just like a, yeah. Could you explain the part that uh, why it needs, like, why does your right need to be less than eta times some absolute value of the function? Yeah. Like, I don't see what advantage this, I'm saying that you can approximate the Newton step and it'll still work. It's not better than Newton, it's worse, right? So like in general, these approximate Newton methods will have worse convergence rate, et cetera, et cetera, right? But what this is saying is like, it's okay to approximate this thing. It'll still probably converge as long as your approximation is not super terrible. And that in fact, the convergence rate's not that terrible either. It still works really well. Um, so so we, basically this is saying in the ILC algorithm, we're using this nominal approximate model that isn't matching the real system, right? Uh, and it's saying base, and we're using that to compute the KKT matrix. And then we're using like the real stuff on the right-hand side. This is saying basically, as long as that nominal model is kind of in the ballpark, the Newton step you're computing with ILC will still give you a descent direction and still like actually converge as long as the model's not so far off, right? So even though it's an approximate model that's not exactly matching the real system, this result is basically saying, yeah, that's okay. You'll still converge um, as long as the error is kind of bounded. Does that make sense? Yeah. This does not, no. This is not talking about convex. This is just generic root finding problem, right? So no assumptions on anything here other than really here smoothness, right? So you can take these derivatives. So this would be assuming like C2F, right? But not, um, so this is a, what I just wrote down is a root finding problem to be clear, not a minimization problem, right? Just this very generic, like find F of X equals zero using Newton's method. And like, that's the result. Does that make sense? Yeah, convexity is like a whole different beast that is specifically for minimization problems, right? Where you're minimizing a scalar function. Okay, yeah. So for ILC, do we have a disturbance? How would that affect your... Yeah, that's a really good question. So the we didn't do this, but generally speaking in the theory of ILC, you assume you're, you're, you really want a deterministic system um, because you're doing these, you need it to be reproducible, right? 
So you can show that it'll still converge with like additive white Gaussian noise reasonably well. Um, but if there's like weird stuff that's, you know, non Gaussian biased, blah, 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 that's happening, uh, it's probably not going to be great. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is, we did all this right in the deterministic setting so far, right? And you can generalize it to the like sort of stochastic Gaussian case, which is basically like a small noise assumption, right? So as long as the noise isn't big, isn't pushing around too much and is not biased, this will work great. If you have some weirder, very stochastic setting, this is probably not what you want. That said, in general, most of the robot sort of problems that we deal with, at least in control, right, are pretty deterministic, right? Like definitely all the industrial robot stuff, most of the legged stuff flying, like in general, this stuff is pretty deterministic and like, you know, there are, you know, you can imagine things where there is stochasticity for real, like wind gusts on a flying thing or something. Yeah, but that's kind of a different story, right? This would be like, I'm trying to, um, that said, you know, if you have a constant wind, this will work great. In fact, I'll show you a video of this in a second. Um, okay, so any, any stuff on this? Okay, so we, I did this last time at the end, but uh, in the interest of not, you know, sort of going, you know, past time on people who can't stay, let's, let's do this again real quick. So who was around last time? Who didn't see this last time? Yeah, so let's do this real quick. I'll be a little fast about it. So this is ILC on a carp pole. Um, same carp pole stuff, like demo we've been doing. Um, so what I'm going to do first is solve a swing up problem with uh, offline trajectory optimization on a nominal carp pole model. This is with Altro, the, the solver from my lab. Converges, you know, in like, I don't know, what this take? 25 milliseconds. That's pretty good. Um, so uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to write down a... a bad model. So we just did this with like the perfect nominal model, right? Now we're going to write down like a true model. So this true dynamics. And what I'm going to do is just perturb a bunch of stuff. So I'm changing the mass of the cart, the mass of the pole by a little bit, just kind of random stuff, changing the length of the pendulum. And then, so that's all kind of in the same model class, right? Um, and then I'm also going to add in a really gross nonlinear friction term, which is this is intended to approximate Coulomb friction. So this is weird tangent function stuff. It's kind of gross, right? So, okay, so that's our true dynamics model. And this is intended to be kind of realistic. Uh, so there's like stiction, that kind of stuff. Uh, we're gonna do compute some linearization stuff here. We're gonna compute an LQR controller that I'll use in a second. Now we're gonna roll it out on the true dynamics and see how we do. So obviously this does not swing up successfully, right? Um, so uh, this is just plotting, everything's open loop. What I can do now is I can throw an LQR tracking controller on it. Try this again. So you can see with LQR feedback, this looks really good. It swings up, but the catch is it's violating the torque limits on the actuator. And this is kind of obvious, right? Because I put, I made it heavier and I put friction on it. So it needs more torque to swing up, right? So um, this is kind of bad though. So if I go in here and I enforce the torque limits in the simulation so that it's clipping, uh, now it's going to fail again, right? And LQR, because LQR can't like have access to that extra torque, Okay, so now we're going to do ILC. I'm going to take the um, LQR controller out. We'll just run it open loop a bunch. So we'll go ahead and do that again. All right, fall down. Here's the ILC part. So I'm going to solve a QP. Um, I'm writing down a tracking cost. And in particular, the tracking cost is weighting the, the theta state really heavily and saying, I don't really care about the cart position. And then, yeah, some nominal cost on the, the controls, whatever. Here I'm computing that gradient vector on the right-hand side from last time. And you can see this is um, the nominal trajectory showing up in here, right? So this is getting at, uh, updated at every time through the loop. Um, also gonna write down, so here's the dynamics constraints, just like before, right? A minus BI and that big Jacobian. Uh, and then also over here, these are my upper lower bound torque limit constraints. And here are the nominal trajectory showing up in here, right? Because I'm enforcing the torque limits on delta U that's inside this QP. So I have to sort of adjust that every time based on the nominal thing. I'm gonna go ahead and solve this with OSQP. And then I'm gonna update just like we wrote down. Cool, so I'm pulling the U's out and updating the U. Now I'm gonna go back and run this again on the true dynamics. And we should do a little better. That's not spectacular, but we're gonna run this a handful more times and you'll see pretty quickly. So that was like one trial, two trials getting a little better, right? Um, three trials getting better. 
and now like a couple more times and it'll nail it. So this is like five times, right? It's basically there now on the swing up. Do a couple more. So six rounds, it's basically there. Do one more maybe. And this is like the seventh trial, right? It's basically there. Maybe we'll do one more for fun. And you'll see that like basically this thing nails it. Yeah, so now it's like perfectly hitting the end state basically. So that's eight trials on the on the nominal. Like if you were doing this on real hardware, right? This would be like, you know, whatever weirdo nonlinear friction is in there, whatever model mismatch, like under 10 rollouts on the real hardware. And it's basically nailing it perfectly, right? Uh, okay, so that's ILC working. Any questions about that? So here you kind of got the problem to make up for our back to fail because you said that you would have been sufficient so yeah. How about is it to maybe set the curve before we and um, upper bound our weight of our, our matches? Yeah. Such that we can ensure that the um, tracking out starts to work. Yeah. So this is like a classic move, right? So you would conservatively set those control limits in the offline optimization well below the actual ones to give your tracking controller a little breathing room. Mm -hmm. The other similar thing that's super common is if you have obstacles, you do obstacle inflation. So yeah, this is a classic, like, you know, practical solution to this problem that people absolutely do. Um, I guess the, the counter argument to that is you're always giving up some performance, right? Whereas here you can like basically like adapt and dial it in, you know, perfectly. Um, yeah, I don't know, they're, they're different. I mean, you can obviously engineer situations but in which those solutions will also fail. So yeah, is there, is there a classic problem where it's better to use ILC over trying to save ourselves a bit of uh, the way with the traveling metro? Ah, uh, so yeah, so there's definitely situations where the that kind of approach will still do poorly. So actually the wind, the constant wind quad rotor example is a pretty good one. If I have like some big, you know, crosswind that's like constant where it's reproducible and I do a bunch of rollouts, um, you can throw LQR on there, even if it's well within the torque limits, it's going to blow sideways a whole bunch and have a huge final tracking error. Yeah. Um, so whereas if you do a handful of ILC trials, it'll just nail it perfectly and they'll figure out how to compensate for the wind. The other way to do that would be various online adaptation strategies where you try to estimate the wind, you know, and like cancel it out in your controller. So there's other solutions to this stuff, right? But like, um, yeah, that strategy of like giving yourself some room on the constraints is a very classic move that's pretty standard. And I mean, almost always when you're enforcing inequality constraints in these problems, you want to be conservative and use like inner inner approximations of the true bounds, right? Because you don't really know often super well what's going to happen. The other example that's like friction cones mm -hmm. for like a locomotion, you almost always want to do an inner approximation and not go right up to the limit. Because you know if your knowledge of where the limit actually is is not so great, then you know bad things can happen. So that's a good point. Yeah, that's a very standard move. Yeah. So just to clarify, how do you produce like say that kind of real robots? Um, would the move be to like initialize the convection slightly, like not every that I'm assuming so these rounds are like twenty five milliseconds, right? So you can assume like five iterations of this converge pretty well. Like if you run it around like ten ten hertz ish, like a bit like, right? like five iterations. Then uh, like would you do this at every like like every ten ish hertz? Or no, no, no. So this is like a one time thing. Okay. So like I have some nominal. Like think of this as like there's a task I want the robot to perform, right? And it can be whatever. It can be like a long, complex thing that like some industrial robots doing, right? Whatever. As long as that task is like repeatable and deterministic, uh, if I have some tracking error, right? I can basically go do this a handful of times, you know, five to ten times, and just nail the tracking performance to be perfect. And then as long as the model doesn't change, right? As long as the hardware is consistent it's good to go. You can just do it forever after that. Where this might need to get done again, right? In that example, right? If there's like wear and tear on the, you know, stuff and you get like, you know, bearings wearing and different friction properties over time, stuff like that, then you'll start to get more drift maybe. And then you may want to do this again, right? Um, and there's various flavors of this that you could call like online learning where you'd kind of constantly be doing this, right? All the time and, and updating. So you do that, right? There's a lot of flavors of this you can imagine doing. It's a it's a very general idea. This is like one particular flavor of it um, that uh, I want to show you guys. So before we like leave this topic, I want to find um, the video that I had up before for last time that I now lost. So give me one sec to pull it up. Some YouTubeage. 
Uh, where to go? Way too much garbage YouTube. So I've got my essay content. written and I've been working on it for about a week. So now I'm going to show you how I use grammar. Okay, here we go. So this is from about 10 years ago from um, Rafti and Jay's group at ETH Zurich. And this is them doing exactly the algorithm we just did on quad rotors to do really awesome tracking stuff. So I should say too, these guys are using the cartoon rigid body model of the quad rotor that we did. And then they're executing these really aggressive aerobatic things that have all the weird aerodynamics and you know uh, motor stuff going on that's unmodeled. And, and basically they get it you know, perfect uh, in a handful of trials. These guys have, uh, Raf Andre did a TED talk a few years after this. So they did like insane demos of aerobatic crazy stuff and like had a demo where they put a wine glass on top of the quad and flew it around without spilling. And all of it's done with this basically. You can see how bad that is. Three trials, you know, five trials, it's like really good. Uh, this is the wind gust thing we just talked about. So they get this working, they turn on the fan, then it's bad, but it's a constant bad, right? That's the key thing. So obviously that's garbage. Now you just rerun this a few times and you get perfect tracking again with the, with the wind. So yeah, pretty cool, super effective, cheap to do, works. Yeah. Um, you might talk about this last time I but is there any way to like reconstruct the actual dynamic model from this? Like, so no. I mean, this is very explicitly not trying to do that. And like that's there's a reason for that, right? So like actually constructing the full dynamics model, um, it's sort of ill-posed and it's also like a much bigger problem, right? Like trying to have so just this one trajectory doesn't really tell me a lot about the dynamics, right? I need to like have enough samples over enough region of the state space, even just locally around this trajectory. I'd need a bunch of samples in the neighborhood, right? To, to fit some kind of dynamics model that's gonna be reasonably accurate in the neighborhood of that nominal trajectory. Um, and I'd also like even a linear model, right? If you think about it, that linear model is telling you if I perturb the state in all these different directions around that nominal trajectory, it has to tell me what's gonna happen, right? So just having the one trajectory data point is like way insufficient. I would need, like roughly speaking, a sample point, you know, a trajectory sample in like every possible perturbation direction around that nominal trajectory to get enough information to just fit a linear model. If that makes any sense. And then if you're talking about doing a more general nonlinear model, the situation is, you know, maybe arbitrary. Like if you wanted to like learn a neural network model for the dynamics, right? That would take thousands of rollouts to get enough data, even to fit like a kind of reasonable local model in some region. Does that make sense? So because here we're really just trying to update this one sort of U trajectory, we're not trying to fit very much, right? It's like, you're, you're trying to fit less stuff to the data, right? And the more, like, the more parameters you're trying to fit, the more data you need, kind of obviously, right? So fitting one U trajectory versus fitting an entire dynamics model that might be parameterized by like some crazy number of neural network weights or whatever is a way simpler problem, right? Um, if you have a parametric model, uh, so let's say in the carpool example, you, you knew everything really well, except for say like one mass number, right? One scalar mass that you could do really effectively, really quickly, right? So if you have only a couple of parameters that you need to fit, then you can do it really efficiently. But if it's like some generic function approximator kind of thing, then you need a ton of data. Does that answer the question? Cool. Yeah. If on the drone that you showed, uh, if you didn't have any disturbances on the first iteration, and then on like seven days you added and then it adapted to it. Yeah. When you move the disturbance, would the next iteration? It would be bad again. It would have to relearn, yeah. I mean, because this thing, right, it's like, it's basically adapting this open loop trajectory, right? And so, yeah, if you change anything, it's gonna be bad again. And then have to, yeah. So if you have like constant mass up on that, you would still be able to like basically get the, the stuff bang on. Yeah, yeah, as long as it's consistent from trial to trial, this will learn what to do. Is there like a case where you can make it break or is this like really good? Like, I mean, this is really good. <laughs> it works really well. As long as you're doing a like deterministic repeated task, right? As long as it's that kind of thing, this is like probably the thing to do. Yeah. Um, if you, I'm trying to think of like ways in which to this could happen more about the part. If your nominal track goes one way around the obstacle, yeah. If your in track or your, your um, 
the active factor goes the other way around up. So could this get stuck? Yeah, so be able to absolutely. So that phenomena is like a more general problem with these just optimization in general. It's like these are all local methods, right? So the word for which you just, the fancy math word for that is uh, that these trajectories lie in different homotopy classes. Have you heard that word before? Basically means that they can be like, that means that they can be like continuously deformed, you know, between each other. And basically you have an obstacle in the, in the way you can't like deform through the, the obstacle, right? In a feasible way. So like, that's a general problem. Like with most like SQP style methods like this, if you're just doing offline trajectory optimization, if you seed it with an initial guess that goes around the obstacle to the left, if there's like a really nice low cost trajectory that goes around to the right, it will never find it. There's ways you can make that happen, but they kind of in the, in the like machine learning lingo that corresponds to like exploration strategies, you have to like do something to like get the thing to try out multiple paths. So in this kind of old school control, like trajectory optimization context, you can imagine doing various flavors of like random restarts, right? Like sampling random initial guesses and stuff like this and just trying a whole lot of stuff, which is a very common move. Um, for really hard problems like that. Um, but usually, right, these things work great if you have a reasonable guess. So if you have some intuition for the system, you can cartoon something, mm -hmm. this will like nail it in. So, but yeah, that's like absolutely a real thing that's more more general than this. Yeah, I mean, it basically comes down to like the local basin of attraction idea, yeah. right? Like you're gonna go towards whatever that is and obstacles like, you know, like basically brick walls in that sort of landscape that you can't cross, right? So you, you never will. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Switching gears. So that's, oh yeah, sure. So the wild two, so like it's, it's like it's under the same category. As the I mean, you can consider this policy. This is basically like a particular, you can, you can absolutely consider this like a policy gradient method um, where the policy class, like the function class, the policy that you're optimizing is that U bar trajectory, that open loop U trajectory, right? If that's your policy and those are like, like literally U bar sub K is your, are your thetas in your policy, right? These are the, the policy parameters that you're optimizing. So it, you can totally consider it like a, it's a very simple sort of really, really like bare bones policy gradient method. Okay. Yeah, I mean, bit like what's a policy gradient method, right? You do rollouts, collect some errors, and then like do some kind of descent step on your, your policy weights, right? So if, you're, if your policy is open loop U trajectory and your weights are just the elements of that, that matrix, like that, this is it, this is policy gradient. Um, this is actually doing Newton rather than, you know, or quasi Newton rather than gradient descent, right? Which is why you get really fast convergence, but it's in spirit, like really a policy gradient method. Yeah. Yeah, so like if your, your convergence would, would depend on, like if you want your, like, your error to be less than one or something, mm -hmm. Um, if you have like a bad model or if you can't constant, like if your, if your disturbance is too high, it, would that like affect your ADA and like stop you from learning? Yeah, absolutely, right? So this is kind of assuming like that ADA is gonna totally depend on the quality of your linearized model, right? And how, how far off it is from the real thing. Um, yeah. Okay, anybody else? All right, so we're gonna totally switch gears now. We're going to talk about stochastic optimal control stuff. Uh, get rid of this. Okay, cool. So uh, we'll see how far we get on this story. So stochastic control. Just as a short, like who here, like if I say like multivariate Gaussian, is this cool with everybody? Has anyone not done like basic statistics -y probability stuff here? Everyone's good? Okay, well, we'll, we'll review a little bit, but I'll, I'm gonna start throwing around that kind of language. So hopefully that's all right with everybody. Okay, so, so far we, um, we've assumed that basically um, we know the systems, so, you know, we talked about ILC is relaxing, you know, knowledge, perfect knowledge of the system's model, right? This is kind of a different thing. This is just, uh, saying, you know, even in the ILC context, right? When we're doing these rollouts, we're still assuming that we have perfect knowledge of the system's state, right? So like, I assume when I roll it out, I get this, you know, state and control trajectory that I'm using when I feed it back that I'm assuming is perfectly known, right? And so that's the assumption we're gonna relax now.
So obviously in general, like we can't even directly measure the state in a lot of situations, right? You get like noisy measurements of things related to the state, but like not necessarily the whole thing. So the question is what happens to like everything we've talked about uh, when all we have are noisy measurements of not even the state, but just quantities related to, and when I say related to in the statistical sense, I mean correlated with uh, Okay, so what happens? So, so we get measurements of these things y that we assume are functions g of, of x, right? So assume there's some state x, we don't have direct access to it. All we have access to are these y's that are functions of x, right? So classically, right, this is like, you know, simple examples of this is if I go fly a drone around in a motion capture arena, which is a pretty benign setting, I'm only getting direct measurements of the pose, like the position and orientation, position and attitude, not the velocities, right? So I have to come up with some way of computing the velocities and we can do fancy versions or dumb versions of that, but like that's an, an example of this, right? Okay, so in general, what's going on here is we've been living in this deterministic setting where we have a state vector X and we just compute things on X, right? Trajectories, feedback policies, whatever. Now we're gonna go to this new setting, stochastic setting where there's noise on a, a bunch of stuff and um, the best thing we can get, we can't get this state, we can get instead the probability distribution over the state conditioned on the measurements that we can actually get, right? Does this notation make sense to everybody? Everyone's seen this kind of thing before? So this is the PDF probability downside function of the state uh, conditioned on the measurements. And yeah, I think probably a lot of you have done like RL flavored things before. So this is kind of the, the typical setting of, of RL. Um, okay, so what we can do now is write down basically the stochastic generalization of the optimal control problems that we've been solving, uh, which look like, you know, essentially all we do is everything we've done so far, wrap it in an expectation, that's it. And that's the, the stochastic version of the problem. So, you know, basically what we're trying to solve is min over u of like the expected value of the cost, right? Almost the same thing. Um, okay, so in principle, in theory, um, we can just solve this with dynamic programming like we've been doing. Um, Uh, but in general, this is very hard and impossible uh, exactly, right? This is the classic cursive dimensionality that kind of we all probably have heard of before. Okay, so um, questions about this? I'm good with this, yeah. Probability density function. So probability distribution, right? So like what we're gonna do next is a Gaussian. So just think about a normal distribution, right? Over the state for, for today, yeah. Is this efficiently cost? Uh, it's the expected value of the cost function. Yeah, makes sense. We're like X and U are random variables now, basically. <laughs> um, interestingly, right, uh, what is the, so this is maybe a little subtle and weird and not consistent, super consistent. About that. The solution to a deterministic optimal control problem, right? What we solved before is an open loop trajectory, right? What's the solution to this problem? <laughs> yeah, and in, sorry? Yeah, so, so it would be like here, 
uh, would be a distribution if you're solving it like this, or like in general, it's a feedback policy, not a, um, so it'd be like, you know, the probability uh, density function of you conditioned on the state, right? Is basically the answer to this, which is really a feedback policy. And this is like kind of you, the usual home for playground of RL. It's like this, this setting, right? The stochastic setting, which arguably isn't really what you need for most robotics problems. Just throwing that out there. But uh, it's definitely interesting. There's a lot of cool things in here. Okay, so we're gonna talk now is LQG. Who's seen this before? Couple people. Okay, cool. So this is a very special case of the stochastic, the general stochastic problem that we can actually solve in close form. Okay, so we have L for linear dynamics. Q for quadratic cost, and G here is for Gaussian noise. Okay, so this is like basically the stochastic version of the LQR problem that we've already done, and has some fun twists and turns in the in the story. So we're gonna sort of dig in this a little bit. So the dynamics here are we're gonna do discrete time like before. And it looks almost the same. And we'll do time invariant just for simplicity, but it generalizes in the sort of obvious usual way that we did last time when we did LQR. So this is the deterministic dynamics that we had last time. Now we're gonna add noise to the story. So we get this noise added on here. And this is called process noise. So this is you know noise in the dynamics. We're saying the dynamics themselves are stochastic, right? Not just the measurements, but the underlying like physics has is noisy and sort of unknowable in the classical way we we like. Uh, then we have a uh, measurement model, like so we wrote down the generic nonlinear version before. Here we're going to assume a linear measurement model. So we're doing the, the LQG thing. So here we assume that the, the measurements Y are linear functions of the state. So here, like the obvious version of this, like if I have a particle, you know, double integrate or whatever, where the state's position and velocity, let's say I only have measurements of the position, right? So then the C matrix would be like an identity block and a zero block that just pulls out the positions. Right? So that's kind of simple example. Is, and we assume also the measurements are noisy as well. So here we're gonna have this VK added on. And we call this measurement noise. Okay, and then um, the Gaussian part comes in here. We say that both of those noise processes, so the Ws, the noise at each time step, so WK at each K is drawn from a normal distribution or Gaussian with zero mean and covariance big W. And again, you can make all of these things time varying, right? So the, the A's and B's can be sub K's at each time step. So can the noise covariance. So that big W can also be a function of the time step and the derivation still works. Uh, and then the VK similarly, that's a zero. Yeah, zero. So have you seen this notation before? This is like, this means drawn from that squiggle. So it says WK is drawn from a normal distribution with zero mean covariance matrix W. That's what that notation is. So I'll, I'll write that. It's kind of, yeah, this is stuff we haven't done yet, like in terms of math. So, okay, so this says W is drawn from normal distribution, aka Gaussian. And that the uh, the first thing in here is the mean, and then the second thing in here is the covariance. Okay, cool. Okay, so yeah, just to yeah make sure we're all on the same page. I think usually there's some varying backgrounds on this stuff. Um, I'll write out like the details for this multivariate Gaussian distribution. Um, I'm expecting a lot of you seen this before, but yeah, just in case you haven't, this is what these things look like.
So uh, probability density function P of X, which is giving you the probability, you know, of uh, at a particular X, right? So for a general n-dimensional Gaussian looks like this. Uh, so you have this normalization constant out front, which is just there to make everything integrate up to one so that, you know, integrated over all space, you have probability one looks like this, where n is the dimension. And this is the determinant and P, big P here is the covariance matrix. And then it's the exponential of uh, minus one half X minus mu, where mu is the mean, transpose P inverse X minus mu. And sort of intuitively, also write some stuff down. So mean here, the mean of the distribution is mu. And this is also, uh, probably a lot of you have seen this notation. This is the expectation of X, right? And this is a vector in Rn. And then the covariance is this matrix P, sometimes also a capital sigma is common for this. And this is the expectation of X minus mu times X minus mu transpose. And this thing is an n by n symmetric positive definite matrix. So the way we write that is S n plus plus. Okay, let's see. And then what else? Uh, oh yeah, so expectation, right? Everyone's seen expectation before, hopefully. So this is the definition of that, that expectation thing. So if I have the expectation of any function I want, it's equal to the integral of over sort of all space uh, of the that f of x times the probability density integrated up. So that's, I think this is all the statistics. Oh, one one last statistics thing. Um, so so let's see. Uh, yeah, the last thing we need to know for this is uh, what uncorrelated means in a statistical sense. And this means that the uh, if I have two random variables, it means they're cross covariance. So if I do this covariance thing, is zero. They're not correlated at all. And where these the hat means mean, uh, maybe I should write that up here. This is a common notation. That's not for me. Okay. That was whirlwind crash course in Gaussian statistics. We're not going to lean too hard on this. So, like, if you haven't seen this stuff before and you're a little nervous about this, don't, don't stress. This isn't like a super, super big thing. But this is definitely stuff you will encounter in your life if you do this stuff. So, like, probably get to know about it. So, if you haven't seen this, you might want to, like, look into it a little bit more. Okay. Questions about any of that? Standard stuff, definitions, cool. Okay, so we're now gonna go do dynamic programming to solve that LQG problem. And it's gonna look exactly like the dynamic program we've done before, but we're gonna wrap everything in expectations. Okay, so first up, cost function. So the cost function is just like before, just wrapped in an expectation. So this is our J, this is gonna be expectation of the sort of standard LQR cost thing. And I should probably put one halves on stuff, but I'm gonna skip it because it's gonna be, this is gonna get a little gnarly in terms of notation. So bear with me. Okay, so we got XK transpose Q XK. Okay. So that's the standard LQR cost, right? Just written, wrapped in an expectation. Everyone happy with that? So next move is we're gonna now do the Bellman backup, right? The one step, you know, where, so we're gonna um, write down like VN and then we're gonna try to go backwards. This is exactly like the stuff we did before with VP. It's just got these extra expectation wrappers on everything. 
Okay, so the terminal cost here, this is like the, this guy is just expectation of Xn, just like before with LQR. And then we're gonna call that Qn, our, our Pn, like before. Cool. So now we're gonna to try to write down Vn minus one, just like before, and then kind of bootstrap our way to the like Riccati recursion type of thing. So let's write down Vn minus one. So this is min over u, um, and we're gonna just plug in all the stuff like before, but we've got this expectation stuff now. So here we goes. Okay, so that stuff. Now we're gonna get the plug the dynamic. Yeah. Um, so to the cost function, is that the summation of and it includes the Q and the R term? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So is that better? Okay. Okay, here we go. Okay, so we got this term and we've got the dynamics term. So that looks like AXK, uh, XN minus one plus B UN minus one. Now remember our dynamics are stochastic and we have that process noise in there, right? So we got to put the process noise in plus W N minus one. And that goes, you know, kind of into the, the PN thing there. Okay, all good. I think I did that right. Okay, now we're gonna expand this thing out a little bit. So I'm gonna split this into two pieces. I'm gonna split out the stuff that we know from classic LQR, and then I'm gonna separate out the new stuff that's new in this stochastic version. So let's do that. So if I do this split up thing, we end up with this stuff that we saw before and uh, the dynamics, right? Um, times. Okay, so this is standard LQR stuff. And then I'm gonna pull out the new terms that uh, have noise in them basically, right? So everyone knows expectations a linear operator, right? So I can pull stuff in and out, like so I can split this expectation into two expectations, right? So the noise terms look like this. Okay, here we go. That's the whole thing. So these are our noise terms. Okay, now here's the fun part. Okay, let's look at these two terms over here. The first two terms in this thing, this guy and this guy. Okay, so we the reason we talked about this whole uncorrelated thing is, okay, so now I'm thinking about this is a random process, right? So the Ws are some random noise drawn from a Gaussian distribution. Does that W have anything to do with the state or the control from like uh, that time step? No, right? It's drawn from a random normal distribution, totally uncorrelated, right? 
And this thing right here, right? This is the, this looks exactly like the definition of, of cross correlation, right? Up here, it's an outer product -y thing, right? Okay, so these, the, the message is, these things are uncorrelated. So these terms go to zero in the expectation. So if you, if you haven't done a lot of this stuff, this might seem weird and fuzzy and I don't know, not super satisfying, I guess. Um, those of you who have played these games before, hopefully this makes some sense. The gist of it is that basically these, the noise doesn't have anything to do with the state there, right? It's the current state, the current noise is drawn at that time step. They don't have any sort of thing to do with each other. So they're uncorrelated. Yeah. Yeah, but so that's absolutely true. Right? We're, that's because we assumed up here in the definition of W that it's zero mean, right? So you're absolutely right. Expectation of W by itself, zero, totally true. Here, yeah, that's exactly right. So the stuff is basically a constant, effectively a constant times that thing. So it comes out and it's zero, right? So that's exactly right. So now though, what about this term? What's that term's expectation? Is it zero? Anybody have any thoughts on this? Anyone? It's not zero. It's very closely related to the big W, but not exactly, right? So big W is little w times little yeah, w transpose, right? So this has the P sound. So they're very closely related, but not exactly the same thing. Um, so in particular, this is a scalar. Right, oh. it's a scalar inner product. Um, you can write this in terms of big W. It's related to the trace of the big W. Um, do you actually, do you know the trace trick? It's kind of fun. Okay, nah. So this is actually, if you wanted to write this down, it's trace of big W times P, oh. which is fun, fun fact. I don't know if anyone cares. Okay, well, actually we'll talk about the, tra the trace trick is fun. That's a good one. So the point is this thing's a constant. Okay, so the, the punchline from this entire exercise is that when I add noise to the LQR problem, I get all the standard LQR stuff. Then I get a bunch of noise terms that either cancel out to zero or is a constant. So what this is telling you is that none of the noise terms affect the answer. All it's doing is making the entire cost higher by some term that just depends on the size of W. So the more noise, the more the cost is going to go up on average, but I can't really do anything about it in the controller. So this is saying to you that the controller has no, is not impacted at all by the noise. And the answer to this problem is the standard LQR controller. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, cool. Uh, I have a question okay. about that. Yeah, sure. Um, so W, like the, the covariance can be state dependent, right? Of, of like little W. So in general, yes. In which case those things would not be uncorrelated and that the answer would not hold. Okay. So, so, so we're assuming that it's not state dependent. Absolutely. Yeah. That was like sort of baked in at the beginning here. So it can be time varying. It can't be state dependent for this to hold. If it gotcha. is state dependent, it's not an LQG problem. And yeah, in general, they, things will be correlated. And the controller will be sort of dependent on things, right? Okay, yeah. Okay, so the punchline is, and this whole thing is noise terms have no impact on the controller. Um, you just get a higher cost. Okay, that's fun. Uh, so, yeah. Just a quick question. How weak is your observation? Yeah, so in general, you can't do it optimally, uh, right? Because that's basically the the ultimate answer to all of this is that this is what's called a POM DP, partially observed Markov decision process. Solving those in like 
you know, continuous state and action spaces is like awful and terrible and intractable. And you have to do approximate things, right? So the practical answer to your question is you would like write down an EKF or something and like do sane things. The other answer to that is if it's really low dimensional, you basically could grid the space or use function approximators and try to solve approximate dynamic programming, you know, um, which is super expensive and super hard and generally not worth it. Uh, unless, I mean, there are problems where you have to do that, right? But like for most control problems, like we can get away with, you know, uh, the stuff I'm about to tell you, basically. Yeah. If the noise stuff is not zero, I mean, that's just bias. It's just like not zero, right? That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Basically, yeah. You what you end up doing is like augmenting the state or like uh, wrapping that in somewhere else um, so that it fits this. Basically, the L, the LQD problem that is the definition. There's lots of games you can play to take a problem that doesn't exactly fit that setup and transform it such that it does. Um, the classic examples of this are, yeah, state augmentation, uh, et cetera, et cetera, yeah, to, to make it fit this set of assumptions. Okay, anybody else? Yeah. Here it does. For this all to hold, it does. Sorry? We assumed it up front at the beginning. And here, um, I mean, you can probably relax some of these things right here. Um, for linear systems, I think the only thing we're really assuming here is that the distribution has uh, zero mean and co known covariance. So I, like strictly speaking, it could be uh, some non-Gaussian distribution that, as long as it um, has those first and second moments, I guess. Um, I think that's true. Uh, there's some other places where it will have to be Gaussian, but we haven't seen it yet. Yeah. Any other questions about this? Yeah. So basically, what we're saying is like, if you have a system such that you know there is Gaussian, you know it's the measurement, and um, whatever else, like you just follow exactly what the measurements you are. Yeah. Okay. Basically, what this is saying, we're, we'll get to this. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to write it down now because we're like, saying this multiple times. So here's two things that come out of what we just did that are interesting and worth knowing about. So the first one is called the certainty equivalence principle. These are like classic, classic control theory results that like, you know, you should get in an optimal control class. So, so here you go. So here's what we were going to talk about. Certainty equivalence principle says the, the optimal LQG controller is just an LQR controller where you replace X with expectation of X. Simple enough, right? That's basically what that result says, right? Um, then, so that's called certain equivalence. Then this thing, uh, this related result called the separation principle says that for LQG, we can design an optimal controller. And the answer to that is LQR. And then we can design an optimal estimator separately that gets us expectation of X to plug in. And we hook those together. And that's our feedback policy for the stochastic problem. And that, that is the optimal answer. So what it's saying is basically in this case, the optimal policy is you can actually split into two pieces, the estimator and the feedback controller, hook them together. And the only thing that matters there is the expectation, right? That has the pass back and forth. Um, neither of these results holds in the general nonlinear setting. You have nonlinear dynamics, non-Gaussian noise, whatever. Um, it breaks both of these results. But in spite of that, in practice, we almost always, at least in classical control settings, we almost always still do this, right? So like almost every robot you'll ever see, you have a state estimator that's taking all your sensor measurements in and trying to get you a state estimate, which is basically that expectation of X. Then you have some kind of feedback controller that's taking that X which is really an expectation, right? Or some kind of mean or maximum likelihood estimate and assuming that's the true state and then making all your control moves based on that, right? So that works great as long as your, your state estimator is really good, right? And your noise is unimodal and stuff like that. Where this really starts to break down in practice is if you have non-unimodal state distribution, right? So if you have a state distribution where you could be in a couple different places and you're not really sure, then you have to reason about the whole distribution in your control policy. And like your, your estimator and your controller can become like very coupled. Um, so you can imagine, right, in the more general case, what this is kind of getting at is that 
you can have coupling between your actions and your measurements such that in order to actually observe the state, you have to do certain control moves to make things observable. And so your estimator and your controller are like intrinsically linked and can't be separated, right? That's kind of the idea.